Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the final event of our 2023 River Watch Winter Speaker Series. Um, for those who are not familiar with Illinois River Watch Network, River Watch is a community science organization, and we train volunteers to monitor water quality in their own communities. The mission of River Watch is to safeguard the future of Illinois rivers and streams through stewardship, education, and sound science. Um, before we get started, please keep your microphones muted during the presentation to limit distractions. Um, we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. Um, so if you have a question along the way, you can put it in the chat box to be answered at the end, um, or you can save the questions to ask aloud. And tonight it is my uh, pleasure to welcome Scott Hayes. Uh, Scott is the president of the Illinois Paddling Council, a nonprofit volunteer group that represents the interests of kayakers, canoeists, and paddleboarders across the state of Illinois, um, and they provide resources and information to support the paddling community. Uh, Scott is an avid canoeing and kayaking enthusiast who lives on his favorite Illinois River, the Sangamon, um, in Champaign County. Scott has paddled many rivers in central and southern Illinois, as well as western Indiana, um, southeastern Missouri, and North Florida. Uh, in addition to his role with the Illinois um, Paddling Council, Scott is a trained River Watch volunteer and is very active with the Upper Sangamon <laughs> River Conservancy. Um, and tonight, is Scott, uh, Scott is joined by James Tracy. Uh, James is the secretary of the Illinois Paddling Council, a published author, and a kayaking enthusiast. Um, he predominantly paddles in the northern Illinois region and has personally explored the majority, majority of that region's rivers. Um, so Scott and James, thank you for joining us and I will turn things over to you now. Yeah, I think James is gonna run the, run the show. I, I have a <clears throat> rural internet connection, let's just say. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it can be a little sketchy. <laughs> So if I do drop off, James can, can step in, uh, but hopefully we'll be good. My, my daughter is a graduate student at a college in Savannah, Georgia, and she has a class tonight, so we're taxing our internet resources. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James. You want to say hi, James? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us on. We greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, welcome. I'm glad you, you took some time out of your Tuesday evening. Uh, hopefully we're going to have some fun and you'll learn a little bit or maybe a little bit more than you do know. And we'll look at pretty pictures. As, uh, that's what I kind of focused on uh, this evening. So uh, James is running the show. So I'm just going to say, you know, James, let's <laughs> go to the fun and beauty. So so before you go to the next slide, I, just, I want you to kind of sit back, you know, deep breath and uh you know i know that most of you are you know maybe all of you are uh you know citizen science volunteers with with river watch so so you know rivers i mean you've been out on the water some of you are, are paddlers and everything else but um <clears throat> so we're going to take you down some rivers uh for the first little segment here to to show you a little bit of what it's like so enjoy uh the show here uh Here's the Sangamon River. This one is one that James took. Where where are we at here, James? Uh, that's going to be the Fox River uh, up north by Algonquin. <clears throat> Go ahead. No. Ah, Sangamon River, at kind of low water around a around a turn. And then this one's going to be the Illinois River um, downstream from uh, Ottawa. It's right near Buffalo Rock State Park. Uh, this one's going to be the Fox River. Um, this is just outside of St. Charles during the uh, St. Charles Canoe Club's Buster Race in May. Cool weather. Yeah, that was a windy, that was a windy day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one's going to be uh, the Fox River in Aurora. Um, this is downtown Aurora with some of the buildings right there, but this is uh, just downriver of the dam that's in the downtown area. Um, there's also a riverboat casino, which you might be familiar with. And then this one's a low head dam in South Elgin. Um, there's a couple of different dams in uh, Elgin, but uh, this is going to be the southernmost one. 
Um, this is again, this is the Fox River. Um, this one is, uh, let me think, oh, that's North Elgin, um, right after you uh, go past the library. Now we're back on the, the wooded Sangamon River. And, uh, you know, this kind of gives them what we were trying to do was give you some shots of some of the more urbanized rivers, some of the larger rivers, some of the smaller, more intimate rivers. Uh, this is a good, uh, good feel for the rivers, you know, central and downstate. And here's a few more, a few more folks in the in the summer season on the Sangamon River. And that's, these are mostly in, in my area of Muhammad. And we go out in the early, it's probably a March float trip and the, hardly any green on the trees. It's still a nice time to go. And again, that's our USRC on the Sangamon River, probably that same, same trip. And here we are. Of course, you can see the trees are a lot nicer. Um, things are looking a little better. And you get bigger groups. Sometimes we go with larger, you know, groups of people, sometimes smaller. Um, always interesting. And sometimes you get run over by a freight train. So. So there you, there you go. You know, but I, I like this shot because you, you see you go through under a lot of trestles on rivers, but you don't usually have trains running over your head. So, uh, and the timing was getting the engine to go through right then. <laughs> yeah, right. <And> the, <laughs> well, I mean, they, they look so precarious on the tracks, you know, because you know, remember the tracks are so narrow. Yep. And then I thought I'd have some pictures of when not to paddle. This is actually my backyard, so uh, yeah, it doesn't really look all that uh, enticing. Uh, and there's another one of these looking upstream. But also just give you a sense of the changing nature of our Illinois rivers. <clears throat> we took some pictures of uh, intergenerational fun, young and old. Throw in some quotes here, and I do strongly believe in this one. This is my daughter many years ago. She's 25 now. Young people paddling at uh, at flood stage. So this is a, a road crossing that's over flooded. Father and daughter. And she doesn't look real happy, but... <clears throat> <laughs> Always a good time on the river. This is kind of a, a little narrow side channel of the Sangamon River that, like a horseshoe that was cut off. <clears throat> so here's here's some shots of the wildlife um, on the river. So so be prepared. And there it is. This little guy was a snap. I snapped his picture during high water, so he couldn't get out of his tree. He was trapped because there's about two feet of water everywhere in this forest right below him. So he's just chilling and waiting it out. I, I don't see that many beavers, but you can certainly see their damage along the way, in different places on almost all of our rivers. And if you live in the suburbs, this is the ever popular white-tailed deer. And, uh, we see them on the river, they look a lot nicer than when you see them crossing in front of your car in the headlight. So uh, so look up while you're on the rivers. What is that? Is it a bird? It's our deluxe apartments in the sky. So depending on where you are, the heron, this is a blue heron rookery. They're, they're very exciting to see and it's nice to know that they're out there. They build these massive nests and uh, a lot of sticks, real loose. Some of them actually look real precarious, <clears throat> but it's a great sight when you get to paddle by one. Here's another shot of the of the herons looking further back. They're all around here. They love the sycamore trees. And there's one of the the residents, and and you can see them real well when the sycamores first bloom. But once they leaf out, you never see them at all. So nice shot that one of our members got. And finally, our 
American bird, the bald eagle. So depending on where you are in Illinois, uh, you're going to see more or less of these. But they do love rivers. They do love fish. And it's exciting to me because when I was growing up as a kid, and that's probably true for a lot of you folks, I mean, we hardly ever saw bald eagles. And they have really made a triumphant uh, return to our waterways and rivers. All right. How'd you like the trip? So I hope everybody's excited about paddling. I'm going to uh, turn things over to James to guide us through. James has been working on our mapping project uh, so we can talk about where and, and how to get there. So, you know, some of you, of course, live real near your favorite rivers. But if you'd like to explore Illinois, uh, this is that portion of the program. Let me take a look at some map resources. Go ahead, James. <clears throat> Yes. Um, so on that note, I'm going to jump out of the slideshow and pull up a, kind of a map project that we're working on. Um, something that uh, I actually had to look up and verify. Um, did you know that Illinois has 86,000 miles of river? Um, sounds like a lot, but it's especially a lot if you uh, look at all the other states that are east of the Mississippi River. Um, we're the highest. So you got to go out west for states that have more river miles than Illinois. Um, Illinois, you know, truly has lots of rivers and it's, uh, you know, kind of unknown until you actually start looking at it. So, uh, kind of along those lines, let me get the map pulled up here. Can you guys all see that? Hopefully. Yeah, no? yeah we can see it. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. Sorry, I'm juggling three screens here. So, um, yeah, so with all the different rivers in Illinois, um, a good majority of them are going to be in the, another, the northernmost region, like kind of uh, north of I-80 or so. Um, downstate does have a bunch of rivers, and as you'll note, um, a bunch of our state's border is actually rivers, um, most of which being the Mississippi River over on the west here. Um, but we also have some Ohio and uh, Wabash down to the south and eastern portions as well, too. Um, cutting through the middle of the state, you've got the Illinois River, which goes on for about 300 miles or so down through Peoria, and then eventually joins up with the Mississippi down by uh, St. Louis. And then uh, all over the uh, northernmost portion here, you'll wind up seeing a lots and lots of different rivers, um, not just in downtown Chicago area, in the Des Plaines and stuff like that, but out west, you've got the Fox, you got the DuPage, um, Des Plaines, Kank, um, Kishwaukee. <laughs> Rock River that uh, goes up into Wisconsin as well, too. Um, so truly, uh, when we were looking through the comments before, I saw a couple of people saying, uh, you know, Aurora area, um, northern suburbs like Offen Estates, I think a couple others as well. Um, we're actually in a really good hot spot for global rivers. Um, most of these rivers you can kayak or canoe on. Um, for different reasons, I don't always recommend like necessarily getting out on the water, depending on the time of the year or the boat traffic or, you know, things like that. Um, but technically speaking, like if you wanted to pull your boat out and go hit up any of these rivers, um, you could. So it's uh, it's very important, and uh, you know, it's a big part of our state that uh, you know I don't think a lot of the general public realizes um, until they actually like get a closer look at it. So that that's why it's kind of a thrill to be here with you all, and you know, I'm I'm just so happy that uh, you know there's other groups out there too that are looking to monitor and protect these rivers because. We have so many of them. It's a huge resource for the state. And honestly, it's just, uh, you know, something great that we can all do to you know just keep it clean and, you know, share it for future generations. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of my little spiel on, uh, you know, basically a good chunk of the river. Um, right now, we're working on mapping out the entire state, um, basically looking to block out uh, all sorts of different um, points of interest. Let me fiddle around with the map here, but uh, yeah, basically, Illinois has lots of dams, you know, depending on your feeling about it. Um, you know, something to just be wary of, especially on the Fox River. You got about 16 of them going from state north to south. Um, likewise, there's lots of launches all over the state as well, too. So, part of our, uh, our organizational theory is like, hey, if people are going to be out on the water, they should be informed. Um, one of the uh, best and worst stories that I ever heard about paddlers was uh, there were uh, three women um, that I was reading about in a news article. Um, they uh, decided to take some tubes out on a river and kind of do a lazy river in the middle of summer type of thing. Um, they didn't know what they were doing. They just pulled their car up to a river and got out and started inflating. Um, but someone walked by and they asked them like, hey, does this river, like how do we get back to our cars afterwards? And the person jokingly said, oh, the river goes in a circle and you'll be back here within two hours. Um, the women didn't realize that person was joking. 
and uh, nine hours later in the middle of the night, they had to get saved by the fire department. So um, fortunately they're okay. So, you know, we can kind of have a laugh about that, but um, you know, having good information is very paramount to making a, uh, a paddle trip safe and enjoyable. Um, and knowing where your boat launches are is obviously a key part of that. So that's uh, something else that we've got to designate here. Um, likewise, um, all over Illinois, there's lots of different outfitters and clubs. Um, you know, if you don't have a boat and you're looking to rent, um, there's places that'll show you back and forth and, you know, allow you to rent boats, which is fantastic. Um, and then likewise, uh, there's actually a lot of different points of interest across many of these rivers. Um, what some people don't realize is there's actually a couple of small rapid sections on Illinois. Um, most of the time you think of whitewater rafting, you're thinking like, hey, Colorado River, you know, let's go down the Grand Canyon or something like that. Um, Illinois doesn't have anything quite like that, but uh, we do have a couple of different rapids areas all over the state. Um, likewise, there's statues, there's, uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright houses, there's all sorts of stuff that goes along uh, all the different rivers. So there's really a lot of uh, cool, like just tidbits of trivia that's uh, all over the state that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be aware of that we're trying to go through a catalog. So um, that's kind of the map project in a nutshell. Um, Scott, before we move on, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or? Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, maybe zoom in on one of the rivers because I just want to point out, you know, how good this map, I mean, James has been working on this map and we're going live. So, so you know, really there are, there are just hundreds of float trips here because, you know, you get a little bit tighter, you can see exactly where the launch sites are. You know, our goal that our goal is also to create mileage in between so you can get a sense of, you know, the kind of journey that you're um, you're going to set out on. But just like that uh, anecdote that James provided, uh, you know, it's just it's so critical that you review the map, you know what you're doing, you know what might be found along the way, such as low head dams, and you know where you're going to take out, you're going to park the car. Um, I did something on the Sangamon River where I parked my car, you know, what I thought was about two or three miles downstream. Well, because that river made a big loop and turn, and that was my Sangamon River. Uh, it ended up being, I was on the river for like five or six hours. And again, just like James said, I ended up being on the river after dark. And I was getting out of the forest preserve that was actually locked up. Uh, and that's where my car was parked. So, you know, planning goes a long way. I'll just say that. I won't tell you the end of that story, uh, but it is very important. And that's one of the things we hope to do with our map. So, you know, please take advantage of this. I mean, we haven't put this live yet. And I also want to say, if your river is not on this map, and maybe as James zooms out, you know, you see a lot of places in Southern Illinois that we haven't mapped yet. Uh, and there are rivers like the Mackinac, the Sangamon, the Middle Fork, the Big Muddy. There's the Cache River Canoe uh, area down in the southern part of the state. We want to get all these rivers on here. And if you're one of the people that either you have a river and you want to make sure that James covers it, or if you have somebody and know about a river, you can provide us with all the information and we'll make sure and get them on this map. Because our goal at the Illinois Paddling Council is to be a statewide resource uh, for everyone that uh, and then, and, and that's what this map can be, you know, so there's a lot of, of maps out there that map particular rivers, a lot of paddle clubs that can tell you everything about their particular river. There's not many resources where, you know, if I want to drive from here up to northern Illinois and plan my own trip, you know, I can just take a look at this map. And again, this, this map also allows you to look at, at rental and shuttle services and paddle clubs and everything else. So um, any comments or questions before we get off of this? I mean, I know we're going to do the more formal Q&A at the end, but if anybody had anything, just, you know, a little a hand raise could, uh, <clears throat> I'll, be, I'll be happy to take a comment. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Well, like, like I say, this is still, you know, we're, we're moving along with this and it's a work in progress. So help us contribute to it. And if you see a mistake or something that you're, uh, you know, confused about or say, why isn't my river here? Or what about this launch? Or what about this company? You know, just let us know. We'll, we'll add it to it. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we get to go down the rivers again. <clears throat> oh my... Uh, talked about the rivers. Oh, okay. Um, so two other Illinois river paddling maps. Um, there's another website out there, paddleillinoiswatertrails.org, where uh, a lot of people are doing journal entries on different sections of the river. 
Um, and then uh, my also uh, my own personal blog site um, where I've journaled a bunch of the entries of rivers that I've done. Um, when I was introduced, I, I think it was mentioned that uh, you know I've paddled the majority of uh, Northern Illinois rivers. Um, each one of them has a journal entry with pictures and takeins and takeouts and if you should paddle this or not. So if there's a river that's close by you in the Chicagoland area where you're like, hey, I wonder if I could do this, um, feel free to check it out and uh, I'll probably have the answer for you. Yeah, I want to stress, I, I gave Danielle a, an abbreviated version of this slideshow. It's really big because of all the pictures, but I'm providing um, Danielle with a, a link that has um, just the slides that have all these links in them to different internet you know, resources, and all these are live links, and um, so you'll be able to have access to that, and, and you can use the links within this show to find different all the different resources that we'll cover. Uh, so yeah, finding friends on your river. So connecting with the people. So there was the map of you doing your own trip. If you want to connect with other people, uh, uh, this is me, uh, of course, on the uh, along the Sangamon River in our collection of canoes and all of our canoes. We we do we sponsor regular float trips and provide these canoes for people to use, and we provide transport too. So if you're interested, and we're not a, a charging shuttle service, although we don't. You know, you can't come to us and say, I want to make this trip and, and we'll move you around either. Uh, we do, you know, regular monthly or bi-monthly trips and annual cleanup and a few others. Uh, but when we do do trips, you can just join us and use one of our boats at no charge. Uh, we do accept donations because we're a volunteer nonprofit too. That's the Upper Sangamon River Conservancy. But uh, so that's one option. I've been joining a lot of Facebook groups. So if yeah, you are on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, uh, take a look at some of, you know, click on some of these links. And this is by no means uh, the be all and end all of Facebook groups. The nice thing about the Facebook groups that I have seen uh, is that a lot of these are meetup groups. And so you can say, you know, I want to do this trip. Is anybody interested in joining me? Or somebody will say they're going to do this trip and, you, you know, you can join us. The other thing is, is that people post, you know, regularly post pictures from different rivers and what they're doing. You also hear about events. Uh, so I've divided them, you know, roughly by region and, you know, so wherever you are. But again, I I think I've joined every one of these groups myself. And I so my Facebook feed is not really full of political news. It's full of kayakers because um, once you join a Facebook group, you get all of the posts, you know, so uh so it's a lot of fun. And like I say, this is not all. Once you click on one or two, it'll actually give you suggestions of other groups just like they do. Uh, I don't know. Just click on Central Illinois Paddling Meetup. That's one of my favorites. Uh, no, the, the second one down, I think. Um, and I don't know if I had. So if I have anybody on the call that's in one of these groups, uh, this is your time to <clears throat> speak up and tell us a little bit about your group. Hey, look. Hey, look, it's the Riverwatch Winter Speaker Series with Scott Hayes. That looks exciting. Of course, Scott Hayes went to all these groups and posted his own presentation. Uh, <clears throat> be talking a little bit more about that. The shot of a, a river launch. <clears throat> You'll get all kinds of news and information. Uh, there you go, Female Friday Fun Float. So that just gives you an idea. I mean, you know, again, I don't know how many folks are actually on uh, Facebook, but if you're not, this maybe this is a reason to get you excited about it. Again, anybody want to speak up that represents one of the Facebook groups, either one there or one that I didn't list? All right, last chance. I mean, I mean, James is with uh, Nick. I don't know if you wanted to say something about them, James. Yeah, yeah, I'll chime in on that one. Um, Nick was a group that uh, I didn't found, but uh, one of my friends joined up with that pretty quickly and got me into it many, many years ago. Um, so I, I'm kind of biased towards it. It's it's one of my favorites. But um, honestly, over the years, um, I've made countless like really good friends on this site. Um, basically, it's just other people in my area, and you know, we can talk rivers and paddling and whatnot. But uh, the nice thing is, you can find people are to your pace. Um, you know, some people when they go paddling, I say paddling, but you know, they honestly just want a float trip. They just want to kick the feet up, you know, taking some sun, you know, work on their canvas and that. I'm a little bit more adventurous. So when I want to push it, I want to do like 15, 20 plus miles per day. 
um, floor somewhere that's a little type of thing. Um, I've been able to find lots of people who, you know, are kind of up to the same type of uh, trip as me. Um, and, you know, we've done overnights together. Um, we've done all sorts of different states together. Um, we've discovered some new rivers uh, all together. So it's, it's really been a positive experience. And, you know, it's nice because, you know, we might disagree politically or religion or, you know, whatever else and all that. Um, but at the end of the day, we've got this thing in common and, you know, we can kind of, you know, break down all other barriers and just, you know, really take something in together. Um, so, you know, personally, I recommend Nick. Um, everyone's usually pretty friendly there. Yeah, I noticed the events up here, too, you know, so you'll find out events that looks like they're doing paddle craft safety and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the canoe races, which we're going to talk a little bit about. So, so yeah, Facebook groups, it's an awesome way to do it. Um, and Let's get back to the, so anybody else, I saw that Hogan posted about a, a club, a Facebook group in Missouri, so along with the link, so we'll grab that. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, you guys can see the slideshow again, right? Yep. Okay, cool. So right. more clubs that are a little bit different uh, than the Facebook groups. So Facebook groups, you typically don't have an, an, an organizational structure. It's just a Facebook page where people can come together. And like James said, you know, we can talk paddling and meet friends. Uh, these are actual organizations. So they're going to have regular, you know, board meetings and presidents and fundraisers and, and host events and things of that sort. Uh, there are many more than this. Uh, these are some of, you know, my favorites of people that I've gotten to know through the Illinois Paddling Council. Uh, these are some of the more, I, I know some of the more active. Um, again, if I don't have your favorite paddle clubs listed here and you happen to be on the call and you want to speak up, or again, if you represent any of these clubs and just want to say a few words about it, the way James did about Nick, uh, this could be your opportunity All right. So you to all of the, all of these are links. All of these all of these links take you to the website of these different organizations. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the rivers like Potawatomi paddlers, uh, most of these places are named after rivers. They're on the Kankakee. Uh, and Prairie State canoeists actually cover a lot of rivers across uh, northern Illinois. Uh, some of these actually I didn't list a St. Charles Canoe Club. Um, Hi, Patricia, Prairie State. Very good. Do you, if you want to speak up, uh, we can we can unmute your mic for a minute. There you go. Okay. Hello. Wait, I was not hiding myself. Oh well, I can't see what I look like. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is my husband, Steve, who Hi. has been in the club for how long? Prairie State Canoeist? At least 25 years. Oh, honey, he said he was in 25 years when I met him 12 years <laughs> ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been in this club for about 12 years. And what you said about making friends, um, that is so true. But this particular club has a lot of... Uh, uh, classes for people um, early in the season, mostly early in the season. So look for them on our website. Uh, very safety oriented. Anything else to say? No, we've, we've scaled back a little bit, pr primarily because there's the Prairie State used to be almost canoe exclusive and now it's reversed the other way around so we had a lot of uh, canoe canoe training from beginners through whitewater i was teaching some of the whitewater um for those of you who knew tom lindblade i'm not sure uh how many of you do or, or did uh, he and i worked together as instructors at one time Well, thank you very much, guys. We we love Prairie State. And yes, that's very true. Look for all of the trainings, uh, safety trainings and paddle trainings. I mean, it's a wonderful resource for, for uh, anybody that wants to uh, learn more about the sport. And um, so thanks very much, guys. Thanks for speaking up.
Hey, Scott, this is Danielle. Um, I, I did want to mention, so Hogan mentioned a, a, another Facebook group that, and that's the, uh, or a, a Facebook page, but it's for a, I guess you'd call it a paddle club, the Mississippi River Water Trail Association, um, which is kind of in the, the Metro East St. Louis area. Well, both sides of the river, because it's the Mississippi River. So they, they cater to St. Louis and Illinois. Uh, but they also do a bunch of uh, paddle safety and getting people out on the big rivers. So um, if, if people are, are interested in, in that sort of a water experience, that'd be another group to look into. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you could, I mean, it, the, our, our, our little talk tonight could go on for a long time because there really is, there's so much to do. And, you know, the more I look to kind of filling up this presentation, I'm like, wow, I could just keep going and going. Uh, so again, you know, you can see that all these are hyperlinks. And like I say, Danielle can provide uh, these slides if you're interested in, but, you know, I mean, you can Google things too, but it's, sometimes it's better to have, you know, the links to the actual group that way you'll get there. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide, James. <clears throat> very selected here actually i came across kayaking in illinois kayaking in illinois this is like things to do in illinois so uh as i was looking to fill this slide up uh because i have some of my you know favorite but again it's by no means you know everything that's out there james has them listed on the map uh, so these are just a few and once you get started you know you can always find other resources but you might want to start your search with kayaking in illinois uh because it links to just about every um there you go thank you marty uh, chicago whitewater association uh which doesn't a lot of people don't think whitewater when they think of chicago but this group has been around uh, for a very long time also I, do you want to say something about that just because it is the whitewater association in a city without too much in the world of whitewater yeah i used to belong to cwa um probably about 15 years ago, um, I took a, a pool session to learn how to kayak. And it was a, an amazing group of people that um, really took the time to get people comfortable in the boat and get them to be thinking in a safety conscious kind of way. In fact, you mentioned um, Marge Klein Whitewater course. She was one of the instructors yeah. when I was uh, going through I think uh, I was taking a canoe course after my kayaking course. Um, and it was just a, a fantastic experience. Very helpful group of people that um, uh, I, I learned a lot from and made a few good friends over the years. You, have you done? I haven't been to the Whitewater course in Yorkville myself. Is, have you been there? Or if anybody else wants to just say something, I mean, it's a great resource for our state and I, I think unique. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really pretty amazing. When I took the uh, the training with them, we actually went down to um, uh, the Maison River, um, which is about an hour south of Chicago. The uh, the Marge Klein Whitewater course is fairly recent. I think they only built that about ten years ago when they took out a dam, and I've been there three or four times now, and it's a lot of fun. It's um, uh, I, I caution people, if you haven't been trained to, to run whitewater, you probably shouldn't be doing it, or you should probably make sure that you're with somebody that's a little bit more experienced, because you, it, it's not Disneyland, you know, it's not like you're going to go through there with a, a tube and um, expect to, to not bump into any hard rocks. There's hard rocks and there's dangerous situations depending on the, the level of the river. But it's a it's a lot of fun if you have a, a sense of what you're doing. Yeah, the importance of training. I mean, you know, if I'm if I reiterate anything on this um, talk, <clears throat> oh, Steve, okay, uh, that I, I, let me let me finish that thought. You know, a lot of people will go to the local sporting goods store or Farm and Fleet and you know buy a two hundred dollar kayak and throw it in the river and and think they're good to go. Uh, but, you know, please pick up a, a safety or a paddling course or a trading course from somebody certified or qualified. Yes, I see you. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> you got a mute. <clears throat> hey. I've paddled the, the whitewater course at Yorkville several times. Um, there's another guy in our in Prairie State. Um, I don't know if any of you know Steve Voss. 
he's mm -hmm. he's done it many many times but the um the course is completely dependent on water flow uh there's no gates that you can open up the way you do in some other artificial rivers um at best it's probably an easy class one and a half uh it's not horribly difficult there's not a lot of places where you can really hurt yourself uh, for what it's worth although if if you're new to swift water um you should probably have someone along that has some experience uh in the event of a capsize you'll you'll make it from top to bottom in about a minute and a half two minutes at the most so that's something to keep in mind um i'm trying to well, you always practice going into eddies and well there's a lot of places to practice going in in and out of eddies to uh peel out uh ferry across the river it's we use it in prairie state for what we call moving water um uh, two which is a, a little more advanced than what we use uh the dupage river for, uh, uh, for at shorewood um which is how we teach entry level skills at one time we went to uh the vermilion river in in utica and i per personally like that better because there's a lot more variety and the river is a little more natural and it's a little more difficult in certain spots but uh ever since uh they had that mudslide several years ago that has fallen in disuse for at least Prairie State, because the people that teach the classes don't want to go there. But I can I I was one of the initial group that uh, they had some advanced paddlers that that tested the river out in terms of where the obstacles were, you know, artificially placed. And so we that was kind of trial and error for a while. Um, but it's it, it's in a good spot now. But you just need to go there a little more often if you want to practice because uh, you know once you get down to the bottom uh there used to be a cart that you could load your boats on and uh you know push it back up uh don't know if that's still there or not very good i mean it's really nice to have resources like that you know in our sure. in our state so uh well and the other thing too is it's uh it's safe now you know that dam that was removed um has killed many people over the years I think it was up to the like 20 or 21 people have died there um, by going over that dam when they shouldn't have. And so that's been taken care of. So that, that's been rendered safe, which is the most important thing. And fortunately, mm -hmm. the, uh, when we were offered the opportunity to have that removed, um, I, I think it was first offered to the folks in Batavia. I'm not sure if I'm right about the location and they didn't want to do it because a lot of the homeowners were were uh, upset that they might lose the little deeper water around their their homes yeah where they could recreate yeah. so it came yeah. that, that extra million dollars you know came to Yorkville and they've done a fine job of it created great opportunities for people mm -hmm. to uh, to paddle and yeah, thank you thank you and thanks to James, you know, there we got the nice little Google yeah. <clears throat> Google Earth shot, yeah. uh, um, so you can check it out. Uh, and, and you, you know, you can have access to the map, so you know, zero in. And uh, I want to point out, you know, yeah, James's indicators of the low head dams. He used the little skull and crossbones, which I think is great. Uh, so this is a that spot, you know, danger, danger. So uh, so there you go. Well, let's uh, let's let's move on with some other parts of the show i got uh, oh i wanted to say something about kickapoo landing which is in my neck of the woods uh so whitewater uh, in yorkville and we have a we have our own illinois uh, wild and scenic river that should say middle fork uh down here it's in danville that's a beautiful paddle so i recommend that people um if you're interested in traveling around hit the middle fork river uh wild national wild and scenic waterway and the kankakee is now a um uh, national water trail so it's one of the few you know national water trail water trail designated rivers in the state of illinois uh, so about all these places um 
you know, Cash River, I think, is a wonderful, I used to live in Carbondale, and they were just opening up the Cash River, but, you know, you're talking about a cypress swamp, uh, you know, one of the farthest northern cypress swamps in the in this area that you can go paddle, you know, through in, in deep southern Illinois, so uh, in there. Go check out the, everything from Yorkville, Whitewater, to Cash River swamps, we, we've got it all. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um, I wanted to review some of the, just a little bit, if you're interested in, in competition and racing, this is where you're going to meet a lot of friends. Um, and IPC actually sponsors a series. I, I didn't really have enough in my slide here. These are some of the ones uh, that happen every year. Uh, we have about seven races that IPC sponsors. And it's kind of cool because we tally up points across races for people that depending on where you place, you know, first, second, third, um, I think the first 10 finishers tally up points. And then across races, we add those points together. And then we have a points winner uh, for seven, seven different races that occur every year. And then we award the Illinois State Paddling Champion um, at the IPC annual dinner. Uh, if you're interested in races, it's probably going to be a Northern Illinois kind of a thing for you, because if you're in Central Illinois or Southern, we have really none of the, I think the furthest South is in, um, is in Pontiac. Um, there's another race uh, down there, but yeah, a lot of these are, you know, held on the Fox, nice big wide river for racing. I mean, a lot of the Southern Illinois rivers don't really lend themselves to, to that, that kind of a sport. But if you'd like to do that again, uh, these are not links, but you'll find the links And the St. Charles club has a really good calendar of races and links. Um, but Prairie state probably does also uh, certainly. And Des Plaines is the, is the biggest one. I think the biggest and the longest of our canoe um, races in the state of Illinois and sort of most uh, respected. So I threw in some pictures um, of people on the Des Plaines River. There's a variety of craft, of course. Uh, the lot of the racers, I mean, it's very open, so don't think that you have to be a competitor. These are designed to be fun. Most of the people organizing the races say, bring whatever craft you've got and we'll create a class. They typically have classes for people in age groups and age ranges and yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not even sure what all and I don't know if Marty or Steve wants to comment on on how that works but you know they're, they're just very open and I think that's the main message that most of the people in the competition side of things would like to get the word out you know I don't feel like you have to be some sort of competitor but anybody want to follow up on that yeah, I'd love to chirp in on this as well. Um, so the the main they actually have two races that they do on that uh, on that day. Um, the main one's eighteen and a half miles. Um, it's a good chunk of river. Um, you know, some of the best people will take about three hours or so to finish it. You know, there's more casual paddlers who will do it in four to five, sometimes six hours or so. Um, they also have a mini thon, which is uh, five or five and a half miles up from the finish line. Um, the finish line being well, right there. <laughs> Well, I think they, that isn't that the that shot the finish line. That's I don't know if I thought right it was. Yeah. Um, so you basically you've got two different options. Um, there's a lot of parents and kids who will do the five and a half mile stretch. Um, allow something fun for the kids to do without it being like an overwhelming type of day. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention too is if you guys look closely at some of these photos, like this person's in a wreck kayak, this person's in a pretty fast canoe, this one's <laughs> on a stand up. Um, if I go back to this photo, like someone's racing this big honking aluminum canoe like they're not going to win any uh, awards or you know send any time records with that thing um but they're just doing it to have fun so if you've never done it before um it's a really great experience um regardless of like what kind of boat you have all right so so racing is always a fun option if you're interested in it again we got to get some races downstate someday um uh, but again it's a short hop up to uh up to that area depending on where you are all right well i'm uh, switching gears a little bit uh, th these are my stewardship uh slides i call it picking up after the careless again we'll open with a quote uh i, I really do I have no sympathy for people, our highways around here, out in the country are trashed, and I, I just don't know how people do it, you know. Gasoline can, I mean, what in the world is that doing in the river? You know, uh, <clears throat> but that's what you find, you know, good old Mountain Dew, or whatever that is. Uh, 
tons of plastics. I mean, these plastics are not dissolving. And as you see this, you know, plastic bottle with a lid on it, it's going to float, you know, any kind of the backups along Illinois rivers are probably loaded with garbage and plastic and styrofoam and everything else. Uh, so here's a person that some of you may know. He was the, I think, River Watch Volunteer of the Year. I can't remember what Bruce won. This is Bruce Colravey, uh, our, our USRC uh, past president, one of the co-founders along with me. So, so say hi to Bruce and River Watch Volunteer Extraordinaire. He's featured in the new film on muscling on the river too. But but here he caught himself a beer can. So so good for Bruce. Uh, this is our dumpster post trip, and I mean, you just can't believe, you know, once you finish up what you pull out of a river. I mean, you know, the, then we're talking about three hours worth of paddling here. I mean, I don't know. There are air conditioners in here. There are tires. I mean, you know, all this metal, you know, and you're, of course, loading all this into some canoes. So I'll show you some shots of that uh, <clears throat> coming up. So you just fill your entire canoe up with garbage. Uh, that people trashed in the river and uh you know we, we got tires we've got shelving i mean an untold amounts of rubber <clears throat> uh so on and on it goes so you know yeah if you're if you're working on macro invertebrates you know th this is an actual car door uh so and i've been told that people going down the river in this, this stretch have found you know the fender and the hood uh, so this is the door and they're looking through. I think the glass was actually intact, you know, when they pulled this out of the river. So, uh, but I mean, the other thing to point out here is the smiling nature of those faces because everybody has a good time uh, despite the work. You know, this was, you know, we were, I don't, I don't remember trying to load this thing in. You can't believe how heavy these get, you know, full of mud and muck, uh, but it's a good time on the river. You can also see that people are standing in the water. So we typically do cleanups in September. We call September now, it's our river month. A uh, while back, I think the middle of like September, somewhere around the 17th was designated, it's our river day. Of course, it's hard to pick and it's our river day because you never know how deep or shallow. An ideal cleanup day is warm, you're in the water. It's also river levels are low, low, low. So you can walk along and see maximum garbage. Uh, so, and then that next picture that, go ahead and flip to that one, James, is, this was a the volleyball pole that I guess rolled down. There was a Girl Scout camp near there, but I mean, this thing was about as heavy as you get. You know, that tire was full of concrete. Uh, you know, it's one, it's a pole sunk in a tire, and I, I loaded that into my canoe, and that was I was paddling this one, and uh, I got probably another half a mile from this location and I was pulling into a fallen tree to get a piece of trash and that thing rolled sideways shifted left immediately capsized my canoe and sunk back to the bottom of the river in about six feet of water so it was gone uh, <clears throat> so you don't really want to put a concrete tire sideways in a canoe uh, that was my lesson <clears throat> they're not necessarily designed for that but again I really like getting the smiling trash picker uppers uh, you know, because it really feels like here we are dealing with people's carelessness on the river. Um, and in fairness, I, I do want to point out that not all, I have lost things to the river during high water events. I, I live on the Sangamon River and I'll have, you know, maybe a lawn chair uh, <clears throat> or a little plastic Adirondack chair down by the river and it'll come up too fast and the river will take it away. So it's not all care. I mean, that is careless, I suppose, but I did find my Adirondack chair about two miles down river hung up in a tree. So, uh, yeah, that's the way it goes on cleanups. Uh, I do want to point out some hazards. We saw one uh, before. So basically a strainer is an area where the water is flowing underneath a hazard from the upstream and you know, in a low head dam, the water is flowing over the top and then creates what we call a roller. Um, I have quite a few pictures of strainers, not a few of low head dams. Let's just take a look. You know, if you come across this on uh, one of our rivers, uh, please portage around. Uh, don't try to get through. Uh, you won't make it. Uh, I mean, you might make it. Chances are you probably would. I mean, this one, you could probably walk your boat over. Things like this. I mean, these are horribly dangerous. Uh, even though it looks kind of simple. And uh, we also heard a little bit about them actually last week, a little plug for Riverwatch speaker series. We talked about, you know, river blockages that are good for uh, macroinvertebrate populations. Probably, I'd, I'd, I'd 
didn't catch all of that presentation, but you know, this one's a little simpler. I don't know if you're going to find it, but these fallen trees, um, again, used to create real genuine, you know, hazards for anyone going down the river. And here's an area of just a huge, uh, you know, pile up of, of fall. And this is not like after a tornado or something like that, which, you know, you'll see these scenes all the time of dead trees everywhere. This is normal. This is everyday summer float trip on some Illinois rivers where you just have so much deadfall. And these trees have, might have even been here for years uh but again it's it's i just you know i showed you all the pretty pictures in the beginning but it's not all fun and games and it's not all safe and you do have to be careful uh another shot of a place where a, a paddler might be tempted to you know navigate their way underneath something like this uh a really bad 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 idea uh, if you're pushing up on a log from underneath a boat, which people like to do, I have seen so many people sink or capsize boats just in that situation. You think you can pull on something overhead, but it throws the balance off on a kayak really quick. And uh, depending on these positions, if you get your boat sideways, a little bit, well, let me let James tell you about this one. It says uh, this is one of his shots he provided. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so this was on the uh, upper Iowa River on the Iowa-Minnesota border. Um, not technically Illinois, but it was probably my worst experience with a strainer. And fortunately, we all got out of it okay. Everyone's fine and all of that. But after it happened, it's like, okay, hang on. I got to get some photos of this because this is bad. Um, so if you look real closely at this boat, it is bending around this tree. Um, this river in this particular section was only three feet deep or so. But uh, unfortunately, like it kind of had an S curve coming into this turn. And unless you like were in the proper position coming around the curve, you were going to get sucked into this thing. Um, so this this boat is from a very experienced paddler. Um, she went into it, uh, basically just got swept in. It was kind of a blind corner. So like she like we saved her. She's fine and all that. But like coming out of it, she's really upset because she's all like, oh, I'm so experienced. How did I see, see that? Like that's such a rookie mistake. I can't believe that happened. And I had to go to her and be like, hey, look, like you just happened to be the first person going down the river and you just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like no matter who it was, like they would have compromised this um, unless they got lucky. So unfortunately, like you just kind of drew the short straw there. Um, but uh, yeah, that uh, <laughs> that was an experience with the with with the strainer. Um, fortunately, she was able to get out and kind of climb up on the uh, on the shoreline here where I pulled her up. But her boat uh, got bent backwards in there and uh, had to get fished out by about a dozen members of the fire department. Um, because even though that water was only three feet deep, um, just the amount of force that was going through on that, like it became a brick or, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use on that. Like we, we could not move it whatsoever. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was last May. Yeah, it's really easy. The problem with a strainer is that your boat can get sideways to the current really fast and pushed up against a log. Uh, and then your upstream end of your boat is going to sink. If you're in a canoe, the gunnel drops under the current. And all of a sudden, you I mean, you, you swamp a boat. You don't necessarily capsize it. Then your boat starts to roll under. Uh, you know, and typically the person can, uh, you know, get out. But you're also, I mean, I, I've ex tried to extricate a boat from rolling under, a canoe from rolling under a strainer in a current. And I, it's just, it's practically impossible. And uh so again, anybody have any experiences with these kind of things they, they'd want to they'd want to share or warn us about? Uh, they have us be on the call. Go ahead. Yep. Just I, hit, hit mute. Yeah, muted you. Go ahead. I've uh, extricated people from strainers a couple of times. Uh, one who had such a bad experience, she actually swore off paddling from that day forward. <laughs> where uh, we weren't in Illinois, but we were in Michigan. Um, in some swift water she wasn't wearing a pfd and she tipped over in a very large strainer uh just a big pile of brush and some and some trees and she was down inside it and her head would pop up every once in a while and uh it's important if people were going to paddle in conditions like that uh where that might happen uh what kinds of things they can do to essentially save themselves because this is really a self-rescue sport that we participate in even though many of us have learned or practiced you know rescue techniques and um, uh, I actually swam up on top of this trainer and I reached down inside it and pulled her up and out of it 
Um, it's important that people know what they could possibly do if that's if if they find themselves in those because um, was it, who was it that was just talking? That you, uh, Scott? No, no uh, Jim, James, right? Yeah, was, I think James uh, when, this one. when people, you know, get caught in a strainer and find themselves in harm's way, um, think about how long it takes for that to happen once they get into that situation. It's almost instant. And so you really do need to know um, what to do or how to try to do um, because people might not be able to get to you to help you and, or they don't have the skills or they're afraid to do it. And that's very, very important because uh, uh, someone may not come to your rescue you, and people need to know that. And uh, that may, may mean they would stay home that day or, or somehow mm -hmm. stop further upstream and portage around that if, if you know that that strainer exists. So uh, it all goes to safety and, and how to deal with it. Yeah, and sometimes it is that idea of, you know, please portage around. I got Crystal with a hand up. Crystal? Hi there. Um, so I I paddle in very remote areas, actually, Salt Creek, Kickapoo Creek, Sugar Creek. Um, and most of them are, you know, there's no boats. You might find, you know, a John boat every now and again with the fishermen putting out bank poles or something. But it's pretty remote. It's pretty shallow and it's very narrow. So self-rescue is usually, you know, you have a better chance than being on a big river or whatever. But I mean, so many people that have taken up kayak in the last few years, kayaking, paddling or whatever, like safety isn't, they don't, they don't appreciate the need for safety. Probably they just kind of take it for granted, you know, in shallow waterways like that, that they're not in dangerous way. So I don't know um, how we can help folks, you know, like newer kayakers. I mean, it sounds like most of you here have been in associations, you're whitewater paddlers and, you know, have a lot of experience. But to someone who's just, you know, I think uh, James said it earlier, just wanting to float and get a little sun or whatever, they really do not understand how quickly they could get into a situation like that. And especially the waterways I'm in, which are becoming more popular because they're easily accessible. Um, there are so many down trees in that. So of course there are a lot of strainers and um, hazards under the water that you don't realize until you get a bump in on the bottom of your, your craft. So um, and wearing life jackets, you know, interferes with tan lines in a lot of people's minds. So um, I, I'm just trying to figure out how like to not be the super nerdy girl. Cause I also was the, you know, the former lifeguard that, you know, had experienced a few bad situations. I grew up tubing on the current rivers, little kid. I myself had been caught in weird situations where luckily I just had enough intuition to get out of them, but they could have been really bad. Um, which probably gives me a little better appreciation, but I don't know how to get to those people that you know, are the casual floaters without coming off kind of self-righteous and weird about safety. And yeah, I really I'm, would I'm, like to inform them. I like this picture because, and, you know, thank, thank James for, for snapping it. Cause I mean, I've been in an, I probably every year I get, you know, and I take new people out cause you know, USRC provides boats and says, you know, okay, well this, then I'll do a trip that is for, you know, newer people. And and I try not, I try to say, do you have some experience paddling, you know, because I'm not going to put you in a canoe and I put people in canoes. They have no clue what they're doing. And in person, yeah. a canoe is harder than a kayak. And, and, and sure enough, you know, you know, you come up yeah. and yeah. whack into a strainer and then they're on water. But I mean, the, the picture, I mean, the last thing I ever do, if, if somebody's in a strainer or caught in a situation is break out the camera, you know, so, uh, okay. so nobody ever sees it. And, you know, I'm like, so I appreciate when you do, this is yeah. a really vivid, I mean, you can see that thing bit uh you can me. see that That's water so i mean that just looks dangerous so yeah steve <clears throat> go ahead steve you know uh, it, get closer uh about that comment that crystal you talked about people just kind of go along and uh, don't worry too much about safety the, the problem is in part 
there's no one to really promote that to a new person there you know as far as they're concerned the best part about beginning to uh get into kayaking i don't see it with canoes so much although it's possible also is that hey i got a i got a great deal at walmart for a kayak and they gave me a free paddle to go you know what do you think <laughs> and uh i asked sometimes i ask them what kind of life jacket that they bought they said well i didn't have enough money i'll buy that next week and and uh, or something like that so yeah. you need to That's be able to impress upon people that you know wearing a life jacket and you know we've all probably seen the arguments online about the pros and cons of what people think about life jackets um, yeah and and people should join a club or the smart ones will find a class somewhere and learn a little bit about it or hopefully like like I was I found a class and I got mentored by some really really good expert paddlers who were people who tripped in the boundary waters or they paddled white water um, if you really want to experience white water around here go up to East Race you know and in in Indiana where they have white water courses that have Olympic trials in them uh, if they because you can control the water flow there and that that'll 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 humble you real quick if you think you're you know you're going to be okay one of the one of the things that um uh, uh when i see people putting on a river um a, a couple of years ago it happened on the dupage here in winfield where where patty and i live is just remind people say hey um you better i'd suggest wearing a life jacket uh the water is really high today and it's moving pretty good and somebody drowned here last week um yeah and they, they they don't like to be told that um but they do need to hear it i have uh, a good friend that i paddle with who i i, I have a, a little tiny piece of video uh somewhere showing him going around a curve and uh he was and he's an experienced paddler you know he had his life jacket and all that but he was just a little bit out of his element and he and he capsizes this was in a canoe and i said steve remember one time i told you that you're not you're not gonna figure this out till you get this shit scared out of you and he yeah. said yeah it happened last week <laughs> and and that's the truth so you know if you have a close call you begin to pay a little more attention to what can happen and how fast yeah. it can happen to you um, well and i'm on a inflatable paddleboard which a lot of people are really amazed at how durable they are because like i said i go over some i'm in some really rustic areas um you know okay. lots of gravel lots of trees and all of that sure. but um you know people when i pass people or i see people and they ask questions about it i have a pfd that goes around my waist the semi auto right. and uh so they always ask me if that has something to do with the board and i said yeah as if my board deflates and inflatable paddle boards are really popular now because people can get them for a hundred dollars at all sure. this year they had them um but I, my sister-in-law learned a really good lesson because she was in a sit-in kayak which i'm not a fan of for rustic creek so i think you should be on a in a canoe or in a sit on top because they're just if you hit a strainer you're going to get water and it's shallow and it's always a disaster but um anyway uh she was in a sit-in kayak that she had borrowed from her daughter and wasn't ter terribly familiar with it i was on my paddleboard well i had a cooler bungee to my paddleboard that i ran under it and a limb snagged it and it was literally in 12 inches of water it was so it but it was rushing it was in a sandbar it was just a really weird situation she was right behind me and literally took on water where we all had to bail out throw all of our stuff on a sandbar and get her canoe or i mean her kayak and empty it out because it had taken on that much water she's like how in the world did that happen in 12 inches of water <laughs> so exactly that's why you're not should not be in a sit-in when you have all these obstacles and this you know the, the water levels change and all the root wads and all that type of stuff but people just don't realize like that again if she would have got swept away as she was being swamped or whatever into a root wad that would have been a horrendous situation but she could yeah. not stop herself from going into me as i was trying to get my board off of the bungee uh the bungee off of the root wad because that's how much force was coming with just 12 inches of water so um, it, doesn't, it doesn't take much for things to happen 
Yeah, no. it doesn't. And the rivers can be deceptive. I mean, the Sangamon is this real slow moving, you know, if you're yep. getting one mile no. an hour of current, you know, you're you're like, man, it's taking forever and to travel. Then all of a sudden, you know, wham, something's blocking it up or restricting the flow, or you hit a strainer and you don't realize how much force is coming down that. Well, river. one of the one of the other uh uh hazards, it really, it wasn't mentioned in that little short two I think it was two things you listed uh which low were dams and strainers low head dams and strainers one of the other ones you see in swift water not even white water are foot entrapments uh if if you tip over in shallow very shallow water and you start walking in that shallow water it's moving along pretty well you can get your foot caught between two rocks mm -hmm. and because of and then you can't but you can't pack take your foot backwards or your body backwards to get out of that situation because the current is too strong. And unless you have someone there to help you, the odds are probably that you'll die. And, and it's in a very moderately moving water. There's no strainer. There's no waves. There's no um, splashing. It's very calm and quiet. And all of a sudden, you, your foot gets stuck between two rocks and you can't get it out. Yeah. Yeah. Let's the, the uh, only rescue for that is from upstream. Let's 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 take a look at just the next couple of slides. I have I have one potential solution. Well two potential solutions. Uh whoa, what happened to the other one? Yeah, this guy. Uh, well here here we are walking through some deadfall. Uh so you can take a, a river hike um if you would like to. This is uh, my buddy Jason and I, I think I'm behind him, but uh, yeah, yeah working our way this is dangerous in its own way and probably for reasons uh that, that steve just related uh but nonetheless um you know you can see the bank is kind of steep there and so we were like well let's just push our way through uh, and then the next slide i have is uh is i was actually doing some chainsaw work uh this is you know not necessarily the best idea and as we'll find a little bit later in the show uh over the last couple of slides rivers aren't really public waterways i mean unless this is your backyard uh you know you shouldn't be working on the river with a chainsaw uh but do note that this river is about what uh a foot deep you know shallow water he just you know removing something you know segmenting the log out so it doesn't cause block cause trouble downstream uh but again, I'm, I, I hesitated to put this slide in here but for last week's presentation because I think the message that we got, uh, or not last week, but the last speaker series that Danielle provided, um, you know, basically talked about the health, you know, of blockages. So, you know, sometimes we do want, there's, there is a good reason to leave strainers alone. Um, and so we should bear that in mind, you know, and kind of juxtapose that against, you know, safe passage or how you get around. Uh, but again, the message I want to give everybody today, you know, is, is really, you know, just just portage around. Uh, but again, depending on your current, you know, you can hit them fast. And like just like James related, I mean, the person that did the, the one in that picture is, uh, uh, you know, was an experienced paddler. So it happens to the best of us. But again, different options. Um and the last thing I want to show, I, I didn't have a, James had a slide of a low head dam in, in the show right at the beginning when we were showing you how pretty rivers were. Uh, this I just pulled off the internet. Uh, IPC has a really nice um, low head dam simulator, a little uh, plexiglass. We're going to have that at Canoe Copia next week to, to really illustrate that when you try. So a low head dam, the water, as I said, you know, in a strainer, the water is ducking underneath low head dam, the water is going over top. There's two big hazards with a low head dam. Of course, the first is that coming up to it, a lot of times you can't see it because the river can look completely flat. Um, and I was really looking for somebody to have taken a picture of, you know, upstream of a low head dam to say, you know, been on your perspective, you might not see the line of that dam at all. And you might be on it, you know, before you really realize it's even there. Um, and then of course, the second part is if you do go over it, then you get into this backwash area, sometimes they call that a roller, uh, you can't escape it. I mean, there are techniques, uh, 
for getting out and you can see some of that stuff online. But, you know, my message to you here is no, 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 you know, paddle around. That's why James has created the map with the skull and crossbones on them. Do not play with the low head dam, not even a little bit. And sometimes it looks like, you know, well, I could go right over that. I mean, this one doesn't, I don't think anybody would paddle, although there are definitely paddlers that would do it, uh, take that back. But, you know, basically don't, try it, be aware that these things exist. Um, and the state, I think I read, I can't even remember, 7,000 of these are still around in Illinois. I mean, that which sounds outrageous to me. Uh, I don't know what the number is. They're slowly removing them or creating things like the opportunity in Yorkville. Um, but these are very, very deadly. And again, once you get into these boils, they're gonna hold you under and keep you under. Um, and, you know, good luck getting out of that, but, you know, avoid at all costs. Did I say the, I got, oh, yes, Amy, well, I'll let James address that little question real quick. Yeah, um, the IPC map, it's uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, we're going to have it posted on our website uh, probably in the next couple of weeks here officially, but um, there's just so much mapping work that needs to be done. Like it's going to take months at least to uh, do a full comp completion of it. Um, but we we do have a good amount of rivers map so far so it's you know again work in progress yeah i think we'll we'll get it up and then ask people to say you know well my river is missing or this is missing so uh right <laughs> yeah, yeah james snapped this picture on the fox and uh you know so this is my last one on canoe safety which is you know don't end up like this guy so, uh, <laughs> anyway steve you were you had your hand up there for a second i was just pointing i was just pointing at the skeleton where where is that uh, that's on the Fox River, downriver from Yorkville, uh, before you get to Silver Springs. I think it's like three miles down from the dam. Yeah, you know, I, li I like that. <laughs> north side of the river. In a perverse, yeah. the In a perverse sort of way, I guess. Yeah. Paddling at high water. So, uh, all right. Well, the last thing I have to cover this evening is a review of Illinois water law. Uh, in my little subtitle here, it's all about to change. So let, let's take a look. Um, so we start out, uh, you know, currently, the current status of, of really almost all, I think it's in the range of over 80%, you know, having told you about how wonderful it is and having reminded you how hazardous it is, uh, now I'm going to tell you how illegal it is. Uh, so I don't know. I don't want to leave you with uh, the sense that you can't. And I will say that it's not illegal. And even though my little picture has a fence on it. Uh, so the status of Illinois rivers is this. Uh, most rivers and there are public rivers and James has a map on on the map and a lot of the rivers with a lot of activity on them are public. Uh, Steve knows there was an issue on the DuPage last year uh, where it actually be came to a head um, there between a landowner and it was actually inner tubers on the DuPage River um, and then another major issue on the uh, Maison River was actually a competition between fossil hunting businesses. It ended up with a property owner claiming his right to tell another fossil hunter that he can't use kayak past his land on the Maison River because he owns that river and it's private property. Now, the Illinois Supreme Court just last year uh, ruled, and, it, and once again, because they ruled in other cases based on Illinois law, that the rivers are owned by the riparian property owners out to the center line of the river. And anyone who paddles past that could be, and I emphasize could be cited for trespassing by the property owner who files a complaint with local law enforcement. And I wanna say could be because I also wanna stress that this rarely, rarely, rarely happens. And I mean, you know, most of those rivers that you cited, Crystal, you're, you're on private property almost the whole way, I almost guarantee it. Uh, and, you know, but you don't get cited. And there's been tubers on that have been running the DuPage, and I, I don't know for how long, and, and all of these rivers, you know, and everybody just respects the landowners, and landowners respect the people on the river. So this is not a big issue. So my message to you is be aware that you don't have an inherent right to be on this river by Illinois law, but also be aware that for the most part, uh, you're not really at great risk of a trespassing violation and, you know, unless you do something that is going to upset. So like a lot of people want to camp on Illinois rivers, 
So, you know, somebody just wrote on one of the Facebook pages, you know, I'm going to go down the Illinois River, you know, where can I stop and camp? And the people that commented back are like, nowhere, uh, because it's private property, which is not to say that you can't camp, but you have to have the permission of the property owner. So certainly the land is private. But again, also, now the Illinois is a public river, so staying on the water is okay. And I could tell you a little bit more about that, but I, my time is actually running, running down. Uh, so right now we have House Bill 1568, and this is kind of where I want to end things. Yeah, go ahead and, and change okay. that slide. Um, this is really good. Uh, this bill is pending before the Illinois General Assembly. It's actually up for a hearing tomorrow before the Executive Committee, and it's a fairly critical hearing because it must get a favorable vote out of that committee to stay alive this legislative session. But I highlighted the key segment and the key part of this bill. This is actually an amendment to the Rivers, Lakes, and Streams Act but it provides that any segment of a lake, river, or stream, I love this, that is capable of supporting use by commercial or recreational watercraft for a substantial part of the year that is actually used shall be deemed navigable and open to public access and use. Yay. I mean, that's exactly what we need. And no action or inaction by DNR should create a presumption against the navigability of any segment. And nothing shall limit the right of any person to challenge the legality of alleged interference so downstate, you know, we get sometimes farmers will try to fence a river. Um, I know that's happened in certain rivers upstate as well. Uh, they cannot do that. And, you know, so again, this is a beautiful act. It's all a proposal still. It has a long uphill climb. So people have, have acted against it already. You know, cattle ranchers, the Farm Bureau, um, even DNR was kind of sketchy about it because they thought it was going to create so much more responsibility for them. Uh, so, and a lot of the property owners have already raised issues of what's called takings in the legal world, which, you know, so this is going to take the, my, my land away from me. Uh, you know, and once you start talking about takings, it's, uh, people get really up in arms uh, about taking their private land. Well, there you go, Ralph. Uh, that's my next slide. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so this slide is actually activated to the Illinois Environmental Council, and Ralph is on that committee uh, with me to work. So the Illinois Environmental Council has been like the lead uh, agency in lobbying for this bill, uh, <clears throat> with thanks to, to Jen yeah, there you go, Crystal. Uh, so you can fill, you can do what's called, this is just a simple, you know, request and it'll file a letter to your lawmaker. There's a witness slip process, I mean, going on now for the hearing tomorrow, and a witness slip is kind of an easy thing to do, but it's a way to register your support. Uh, there's a link for that also at the IEC website. So please, um, you know, do this and it, it'll send it to your appropriate legislator. And if you have connections, you know, politically, locally, you know, talk to them, you know, arrange a meeting and tell them how important kayaking and canoeing is, you know, in your area, because this is a, you know, this is a once in a lifetime. We haven't had a bill like this be proposed before the legislature, uh, in my experience ever, and people that go back longer than me have told me that, you know, that this issue has been true for a long, long time. I mean, going back, I'm talking about like 1925, uh, it's definitely not consistent with federal law. It's not consistent with the law, particularly in Wisconsin, which does have you know open access to rivers, a, a law like this already in place. Uh, most states, not I shouldn't say most states, many states, but I think it's about 17 or 18 states do. Uh, so yeah, go, let's go ahead and put the link in the chat. I don't know if you can handle that, James. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that's, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I don't know the best way to get it. You know, you like I say, we'll give you these uh, the slides with all the links. But um, no, I got eight eighteen on my watch. I'm going to stop here. Um, well, with one shot of of a, a winter in my backyard on the Sangamon mm -hmm. River, just a beautiful mm -hmm. shot. I mean, I love the river. Uh, and, you know, you will enjoy it. I mean, please, despite all of the stern warnings about safety, uh, <clears throat> you know, take that seriously. Wear your flotation, get yourself trained, join a paddle club, uh, and you will really, really enjoy nature. Uh, but Ralph, yeah, you got your hand up. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, about the House bill that is up for um, the meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock, um, 
I encourage everybody to, who's on here to go on that link and fill out the uh, witness form. It literally takes just a couple of minutes. Say that you're a proponent of it. You could just put yourself. If you own a business, um, put that business down there. Um, I did talk to Janet Yang Roar's um, chief of staff yesterday, Donna, and she had mentioned that we have a couple of co-sponsors um, that are all Democrats. We do not have a Republican co-sponsor anymore. We did have a Republican co-sponsor. However, he left, he chose not to run this year and the person who took it over is now a Democrat. So we are definitely looking for Republican House representatives <laughs> in favor of accessing all the rivers in Illinois. So if you know somebody in that field, it, you know, that is a house um, representative who is a Republican, man, it would be awesome to get that person on as a co-sponsor for this bill. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Um, I also run a Friends of the DuPage River Facebook page. We have about 1500 people on there. Wow. Uh, I also started a change.org petition to have access for everybody on the DuPage River. And that change.org uh, petition is up over 11,000 signatures already. So um, we've been fighting this thing for three years now um, because of one custom, one um, landowner on the DuPage River who's been fighting us. So um, it, it takes one person to make it nasty and but it takes all of us to fight it back so just encourage everybody to get on the witness page and join our facebook group as well friends of the dupage thanks thank yeah. you for thank you for having me appreciate it oh yeah thank, thanks for joining us ralph and uh steve scott yeah i'm not sure how much time we have left but uh yeah we're short we'll keep it short and let's let other people talk but yeah go ahead <clears throat> Uh, a quick question. Bill Kessler put out a uh, an e blast, you know, from PSC. Yeah, um, I saw that. And, and about this, and he listed the Congress people in the state legislature that may have have an interest in this issue. And I can't tell where any of them are from relative to Winfield, you know, the western suburbs. Um, I know that the people in the house changed you know we had sean castlin who's very pro nature but but that's federal so do you know who's in ch or, or could you tell me how to find out yeah i had i was that? working off of a really good map i thought that, that you could zoom in as tight as you want um and it has you know our districts are nested in illinois with the how two house members in every senate district Oh, and I'm not, I don't, maybe Danielle can help or James, uh, but yeah, you need a really good district map. You can zoom in tight and see where these, you know, boundaries yeah. are, and then you can figure that out pretty quick. I'm going to assume maybe that Ralph might have some idea. He's so... Got one, Ralph? Um, well, I, I can tell you Janet Yang Roar represents North Naperville and Warrenville, which is just south of you on the right. DuPage River. Um, so... Mm -hmm. She's yeah, close to you. She's not in your district necessarily, but she also has like coffee with the representative things once a month. You can go see her. Um, I think if you just go on the, um, what was that? ILGA, the General Assembly, ILGA.gov. Okay. Yeah. And that takes you to basically the House and the Senate. You can get a whole bunch of information over there. So there's probably a map. I don't have the link to it, but there, there's probably a map that you can look at to get your representatives. Okay. Yeah, I'll, but, I'll send that to up to Danielle and then she can send it back out again. Uh, but okay. if you know a Republican rep, House rep, man, get them on board with us quickly. Yeah. Okay. We got Marin down here. ILGA. Um, Is it ILGA.gov? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on him. Uh, he, he actually said he wanted to be a co-sponsor. Anyway, anybody else have some comments, questions about anything? If we don't, I, I don't, but I, I knew when I brought up the bill that was likely to dominate the rest of the discussion, uh, but I don't really want to make it about the bill per se. And there's lots of discussions going on on Facebook pages, like Friends of the New Page and everywhere else, where you can chime in, get information. I've been posting articles and, and information about 
uh, this bill on the IPC web page and Facebook and everything else as much as I can. Uh, so there's lots of information, you know, available out there. But yeah, any other, uh, you know, people we haven't heard from or you want to questions about resources or paddling or parts of the state or anything else. This is Crystal one more time. And I, I understand the, the property issue and um, also conservation and um, like, you know, clearing the waterways or whatever. Um, but I do know some of the landowners that would probably allow us to go in there and clear out some of the, I mean, full on, there's like three or four trees across particular sections of water. Um, that are impassable. Um, I know I'm always out trying to find new routes and a friend and I spent three hours climbing trees and throwing paddle boards over them versus uh, floating <laughs> to see if we yep. could get from one point to the next. But I was wondering if there are any groups that do that, that volunteer and go in, if we could get permission to go into certain areas of creeks in Logan County to help clear away trees. Yeah, that's the problem with your area, you know, upstate, there's all these paddle clubs everywhere. And yeah, it probably would. And especially if you have, I mean, you know, like that picture I took, if you have the permission of the landowner, you know, you're fine. I mean, you know, and I mean, then you're, then you're going to start angering people that would say, well, you need to leave these blockages in the water, you know, again, and we're, we're talking to Riverwatch and you can watch last week's uh, or last session about, you know, that they are actually a, a benefit to nature, I think was the summary of the presentation that we heard. Somebody could check me on that. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I picked up the end of it and said, you know, yeah, they're very healthy. So, you know, you want these in the river, basically. So, so you know, it just raises interesting questions about how, uh, you know, we want to really manage our waterways. But you know, I would say, you know, a little bit of river trail maintenance is sometimes a good idea. But, you know, it might be good, good to, you know, work with science. And some of the blockages, I don't know, you know, if they're really woody debris. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not going to go there because we don't have time. Um, right. But I, do you have a comment on that, Danielle, or a thought? <clears throat> uh, I mean, so woody debris, yeah, it, it gives an additional type of habitat for the aquatic invertebrates. And then also that that's also a habitat for the fish because it gives them places to hide and a food source from the invertebrates. So it they serve an ecosystem purpose, but that doesn't mean we have to keep all of them there. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. If, if one is a particular safety hazard, you know, as long as we, you know, use caution and and maybe keep keep more of the uh, um, of the log jams in places that maybe are less paddled, some of the smaller rivers and streams. Um, I don't you know, know. We, we can make a balance. I wish I had a good answer for you, Crystal, though, because I, I hear your pain mm -hmm. and, and I've kind of done a little bit of that up here, uh, you know, when we can and when we have permission. And if you're working with a forest preserve, you know, you'll typically have to have their permission. Um, and sometimes they don't really want volunteers to do that. I mean, of course, chainsawing in a river is pretty dangerous, depending on your skill level uh, and training. So, uh, but yeah. But, you know, it's but tough. you don't have to have that either. I mean, we've used chains and winches, you know, to just move logs. So if you pull them downstream a little bit, you know, and kind of open release something or release some of that pressure, you know, the natural force of the water will at least create a paddleable channel, you know, through a uh, blockage. I mean, we could probably do a whole speaker session just on, like, you know, water trail maintenance, you know, and best practices there. There's a really great, you know, information resources to look at. Uh, and, and yeah, there's the danger side and then there's the natural habitat side. Uh, so we want to be yeah. conscious of that and the landowner side. Yeah. A DNR yeah. has said, I talked to them about blockage removal and they said well you can do it but you have to remove 100 percent of the blockage and you have to haul it all the way out of the floodplain of the river because if you loosen up a blockage and a log floats down river and causes harm to a structure then you're actually liable for that harm if you didn't <laughs> well that was interesting position for dnr to take uh, <clears throat> anyway i'm running out of time i see you danielle um so i don't know you want to do some wrap up comments. I, I want to just say I appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us. I hope you've gotten some good resources out of it. And you can, again, I hope you look at the links and the links on the chat. Um, and Danielle said the recording would be available. But yep, okay. Yeah, thank you, Scott and James, for the great presentation. And thanks to everyone else who joined us tonight and, and provided their comments and, and insights. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate um, it.
So before we before the last of you go, um, I wanted to mention that registration for our Riverwatch training workshops is open. Um, these workshops are designed to train new volunteers to monitor stream quality in your own uh, neighborhood rivers and streams by collecting macroinvertebrates, those water bugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you can register for these and any other upcoming events we have year round um, on our web page or our Facebook page. So another plug for the many uses of Facebook in the paddling and water quality <laughs> uh, realms. Um, so Thanks everyone again and have a great night. I will have the, um, the video will probably be up in about a week. And then um, after that, or, and then if you want those links, feel free to reach out to, um, to me at the Riverwatch email account. That was probably in a, a link that you would have received or an email you received earlier tonight. Um, and we'll get that, we'll get the presentation links to you. Yeah, I put my email in there too. If you want to email me directly with with anything, request for the slides or whatever, um, or any other information, you can feel free to reach out to me anytime. And I'm also on Facebook, easily findable. You can message me there. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Everyone. Enjoy your paddling <laughs> safely with a life jacket. <clears throat> Always. <clears throat> and trading. But you'll find if you join a paddle club or a Facebook group. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you, folks. <clears throat>